Well, it's time to cover a really great neoprog band. This is one of my favorite modern neoprog bands because a lot of neoprog that I love kind of came out of the movement within the 80s. And so whenever I find a newer neoprog, I always like kind of latch on and treat them like a, a precious child, you know, because they're so kind of rare. You know, the only ones that I'm thinking of outside of this band are like Comedy of Errors, Mystery... That's kind of about it. So yeah, I just want to protect my little child. So yeah, with that being said, let's just dive into this one. The Unforgivable by Anibis. So Anibis, as I mentioned, is a newer neo-prog band. They hail from Australia, getting their start in the mid-2000s with their kind of debut breakout album of uh, 230503. Classic record from them, released in 2009. Uh, I heard about them first with The Towering of Silence uh, back in 2011, uh, and just it blew me away. You know, their ability to create these more symphonic, soundscapey cinematic atmospheres within this neo prog presentation really blew my socks off you know they kind of take a little bit of a backseat within the melodrama and allowed a lot of the story to be more of the melodrama rather than like the vocal works or the lyrics um it was something that really perked my interest and they still kept that flavor of the neo prog within you know the keyboards and the kind of soundscapes a little bit of the darker atmospheres that are found on there you know kind of you know, emulating the stereotypical sounds of the neoprog, but modernizing them in just a little bit. And from A Tower, a tower of Silence, uh, they really kind of, you know, took the world by storm with the next two records of uh, Hitchhiking to Brezentinum. Uh, I always just call it Hitchhiking. Uh, and then it came to my favorite record of theirs, which is The Second Hand. Uh, since then, the albums have kind of wavered a little bit. Uh, different Stories was fine, but it, it just kind of felt like they were treading water at that point. And Homeless, back in 2020, their last record, really left me cold. You know, I was expecting those big swells of sound, the big cinematic, symphonic stylings, and it felt more like what a pineapple thief was doing and being a little bit less on the big sounds and more on trying to craft radio accessible singles. And it just, like I said, it left me cold. So I was excited to hear The Unforgivable. Uh, it's another concept record, as most of their records are. And they kind of were... Uh, bringing it through like this is a single track album. You know, it's subdivided within 10 tracks, 10 parts, but that immediately pinged my interest. And I'm like, ooh, okay, a single track album that's kind of subdivided into parts. Uh, you got me, Skippy. Like, I'm ready for that. And the concept that we have this time is about a individual and the relationship with this cult and how he's able to escape it and kind of try to continue to escape it even though he's out and them trying to bring him back in specifically around like the Midwest of the US where that's kind of the reality of a lot of different people. And the relationship between what got him into the cult, what eventually made him break away from the cult, and how the cult continuously brings him back in. And it's even like looking outside of the external sources of what's bringing him back in. And kind of internal sources of like, well, what brought me to this cult to begin with? What was it that I found so charismatic and so uh, attracted to this thing? Uh, and... I feel like that aspect when you're looking at survivors of cults is something that is kind of lost because for the most part, it's like I immediately recognized that that was wrong and that I was being, you know, completely manipulated. But I mean, I've spent a bit of time within this past year reading pretty deep things about cults. And there's always something that's been said of like, there's no really such thing as brainwashing. It's just these cults bring about something that was already in you from the beginning and it's this overplaying of those aspects that you are trying to get out of, you know, it's recognizing that those areas within yourself were wrong and that they were wrong for kind of lifting you up through that. Um, and so when you're out of it, you still need to deal with some of those internal factors that made you join the cult to begin with. So I like the fact that Anubis takes some time and really apply that. Like look at the track of Alone, where it's like one of the things that a lot of people join cults for is for the connectivity. It's for that sense of communal. It's that sense of family. It's that sense of belonging. And here on the track of Alone, it's like, 
Well, what do you do when you're trying to break away from it and you're still craving that and you don't have that system set up to help foster and lift you up again, you know? Uh, but then it goes into the track like the chains and it's where that aspect and that ideas can get left behind and become a, you know, something for people to extort. So yeah, I like that they're able to kind of play around with that ideal. Uh, and the music that's found within this is top notch. I wouldn't necessarily say that this is like on the same level as the second hand or hitchhiking or a tower of silence, but it is definitely streets above different stories and 2305, um, Oh three and definitely streets ahead of homeless. You know, this one is probably in that little sweet spot between the three big albums and the three weaker albums. So it's not necessarily their worst project, but it's definitely, you know, it's, it's not quite on the same level as I would say is their best album. Now, that being said, there's still quite a bit of great crescendos and great, great buildups. They're back to that cinematic landscape within constructing atmosphere within the soundscapes. It honestly reminds me of the album Spirit from A Comedy of Errors, which is still my favorite album from them. Not only within tone of having these harder, aggressive styles and landscapes, being thread through much more pleasant and softening and more accessible presentations. You know, there the through line really is this rocking and rocking in terms of the motion rather than rocking as in terms of the music um, feeling and essence within that. Uh, the blending of it being both one of the more intimate and heartfelt and more somber albums that the band has really ever produced, as well as having a little bit more of a harder edge and a little bit more of that rock and tone. You know, rocking is a very good moniker for this record, both in style and in presentation, as well as in actual rocking motion. So yeah, the album opens up with that ideal with part one, A Legion of Angels, being that more soft, somber, accepting moniker. It's it's a perfect way to open up the blinds. And this is the theme that's going to be pretty relevant throughout the runtime of this album. Then we go into a The Mark of Cain, which really puts on a lot of those metaphors and a lot of those similes within the actual story here. And this is where we have a lot more of that driving force. It's immediate. And I love where we get into that chorus where it's like, I'll grow my wings on the way down. It's like, I've fallen from grace. I've committed this act, this, the ultimate sin of leaving the cult, this ultimate betrayal, but I still need to grow my wings because I'm friggin' fall into the ground. I'm going to die if I hit the bottom. Um, and I love, again, how aggressive it is, how immediate and how like yearning and desperate this track feels. I already spoke about Alone and how isolating that track feels. And it goes into the chain, which is a lot more aggressive, a lot more meaty in that presentation. At the halfway point of part five, one last thing, it's it's reminding me of some of the presentation that we had with a band called Car Mechanic, especially within the bass work. Like he's definitely channeling that Jonas Ringgold bass lick within there. And I want to applaud the entire band for really being able to play at their oomph. Like even though he's not featured in this track, the chain part four, the drumming that's found on here is aggressive. It's um, bombastic, but it's never overly commanding. You know, at no point do I ever get pulled out of the track because it's overly complex. It's not what's needed on here, but you need that powerhouse. You need that oomph that's found on there. And I love the drumming styles that is found on here. One of the more frustrating parts about this album is how singular a lot of this feels. You know, it is one track subdivided around 10 tracks, uh, or I guess 10 phases in 10 parts. It can feel a little bit repetitive, like look at the track of uh, All Because of You, feels very similar to One Last Thing, and even though both of these tracks are like butting heads against one another, I just wish that there was maybe a little bit of a differentiation on here. The chorus within All Because of You is extremely heartfelt. It's channeling like some of Steve Hogarth's Marillion aspect on there of being overly emotional, over dramatic, and that's where we get a lot more of those tasty licks within the neo prog. Like again, I love neo prog and I I love these techniques that they're using. Um, but it does feel a little bit derivative. It does feel like they're treading water a little bit in that case. 
But I also want to applaud the band because they're still able to navigate the transitions between the tracks to showcase that these are separate chapters within a bigger story, within a bigger track. The the handoff between the the themes and the atmosphere, say within All Because of You and The End of an Age, parts six and seven, normally, you know, those two could have been jarring and it could have been, you know, taking me out of the experience, but it still flows very well. So, you know, The End of uh, the end of an age, which is a little bit more bombastic, a little bit louder, a little bit more energy driven than All Because of You. Uh, it feels very similar and uh, still unified with the overall theme of the album. And honestly, these transitions work really well right into the end, like back being a little bit more of a somber with still that energy that's kind of found within it. But I want to showcase the final two tracks, part nine being the shadow cloak of the gospel and part 10 being the title track of the unforgivable. I love how the shadowed cloak, sorry, the shadows cloaked the gospel is a lot more of that driven the big finale like this is where everything's led to within this there's something pure and something something really uh profound within a lot of these religious cults that have been twisted and have been profane about taking a, a sacred religious text and twisting it and like bastardizing it for your own self-interest and within the shadows cloak the gospel it really kind of tackles that and it's like this character was moved by whatever it was that got him into this cult and now the cult leaders have twisted it and completely bastardized it um and it shows his his rage about that and then within the unforgivable it's his come down and his finally accepting that he had to break away and he had to do this for his own safety and his own livelihood you know and it's a lot more heartfelt and that final moments within the unforgivable is extremely moving and it's extremely um personal and intimate and it's exactly how this story should have ended so yeah yeah in the end the unforgivable was quite the ride you know I, it put anibus back on track in my mind because i felt like their last album really missed the mark entirely and i felt like this is them getting back on on a good page. You know, it was thought provoking. It was profound. It was everything that I wanted from a good Anibis record. Uh, the overall flow of this record was amazing from start to finish. I mean, this album is 46 and a half minutes worth of music. It's the perfect length and it's got that great, you know, side A, side B feeling of a singular track that I love, you know, this album was practically made for me with the concepts, the themes, the music, the presentation, the packaging, absolutely adored it. So in the end, I will say The Unforgivable by Anibis is one that I absolutely will pick up in physical format. Again, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is their best work. I wouldn't even say that this is within their top three records. This is a very easy fourth record for me within their whole discography if I took it from worst to best. Um, but there's a lot of really good music that's found on here. And as I said, I think that this puts them back on track and I'm really excited for what they have to follow this up on. If you haven't listened to this album by now, I highly recommend it. This one does get the note seal of approval. It does get that kind of run, don't walk to get it. It's been out for a little bit. I will admit, you know, it's been out for over two months and I just haven't seen a whole lot of people talk about it. And I really want to sing its praise. So yes, go and check out The Unforgivable by Anibis. If you're a fan of progressive rock, if you're a fan of specifically neo progressive rock, highly, highly recommend this one. Go and check it out and you will not be disappointed. I can almost guarantee you of that. And yeah, I think that's where I'm going to leave it for today. That's where I'm going to leave it. So those are my thoughts on The Unforgivable from Anibis. What did you guys think about this record? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Whatever you thought, please let me know by commenting down below. That's where I'm going to leave you guys. So thank you all so much for watching. As always, you guys are definitely the best. And until next time, notes out.